Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here today with Dr. Mary Klotman, Dean of Duke University School of Medicine and an infectious disease specialist by training, to talk through some of the current questions faculty and other campus community members have raised about COVID safety and the fall semester. So for the last 19 months, we have worked very closely with Duke's infectious disease and environmental health experts to develop our policies on classroom teaching and student life. This took a lot of work by a lot of people, but we were able to have a safe and successful academic year in the midst of the pandemic. And I really wanna thank all my faculty and staff colleagues uh, for this fantastic work. So now we have new challenges though with the Delta surge and of hearing and reading lots of new media coverage of this every day. So Mary, there's understandable concern and anxiety about returning to the campus and classroom. What have we seen so far? So Sally, yes, the media coverage can be quite alarming and it can be really hard to put the information in perspective. What we've been doing is monitoring the data locally and nationally. And that's why our camp campus efforts around surveillance and contact tracing and our local dashboards are so important. In that regard, our data thus far has not indicated a case of COVID transmission on campus, including in classrooms, when individuals have both been masked and this is in the setting of different types of masks being used. Our practices of masking, testing, and contact tracing have managed level infection on campus, and this will continue. We have now been experiencing the Delta surge for several weeks, with some programs like Fuqua having had classes all summer, and they've operated safely in person. The addition of mandatory vaccinations, in addition to masking, for all students is a very important safety strategy for creating a safe environment for faculty and students in the classroom. Our research laboratories have been back in operation for more than a year now. And in fact, while we've continued masking, even with our relaxing of distancing requirements, within close proximity of each other all day long, we've not documented any laboratory transmissions. So the classroom's important, but we're also having students, faculty, and some staff who live on campus or live in student housing uh, interacting with each other and trying to have as you know, normal a college experience as possible. So from your perspective, what are the most important issues for the campus community to be keeping in mind in this setting? So first of all, I think it's really important to say that we are in a different place than we'd like to be at this point and we, that we'd hope to be in. The efficacy of the vaccination in preventing significant illness has stood up and that's really important for everybody. And it makes the most important intervention for re regarding our own personal health. If you're a Duke employee and you're not vaccinated, first of all, I urge everybody to do so. The vaccine is safe, effective, free, and the single best way to protect ourselves individually and our community. But it's not invincible, it doesn't make us invincible. And it, but it really minimizes the chances of serious hospitalization and illness. So to date, 90% of Duke employees are vaccinated, but we need it to get as close to 100% as possible. That being said, given the current circulation of the Delta variant, which is more transmissible than previous variants, along with the possibility of asymptomatic infection, even when vaccinated, we do need to continue our diligence, particularly regarding masking indoors, symptom monitoring and testing. The effectiveness of masks was demonstrated in the prior surge, even in the absence of vaccines. So the combination of vaccination and masking is our best defense. This is consistent with CDC guidelines and with those interventions allow us to safely resume classroom and campus life activities. That said, we all need to be vigilant by avoiding opportunities to become asymptomatic carriers of COVID. So that's really important to avoid large, unmasked indoor settings on and off campus. And in, in student life, that would mean avoiding places like bars. Within campus, we should follow the guidelines on indoor dining, which we've seen is an opportunity for infection. So I, I should add that unfortunate event that a vaccinated individual does become infected, it is far more likely that their symptoms will be mild. This is what we've seen thus far for those in our community infected with the Delta variant. And in the event of any symptoms, it's important for faculty, staff, and students to stay home as an additional precautionary step. Duke's extraordinary campus testing program developed in collaboration with the Vaccine Institute 
is a national model and will continue. And I encourage everyone who's interested to become part of that surveillance testing because that information informs our policies going forward. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, um, remember that every student is being tested on the way into Duke and then at least once a week after that, regardless of their vaccination status. And, you know, this is not uniformly true across the country, obviously, um, but we are doing that here. Anyone who has received an exemption from vaccination and that has added up to less than 1% of the student body, I should add, is required to be tested twice a week. Um, vaccinated faculty also have the option to participate in campus surveillance testing on a voluntary basis. Now, you know, in terms of contact tracing, we have a team of employees who work with each community member who tests positive to understand where they've been, who they've spent time with, in what situations and situations that could have put them at risk for transmission. The contact tracing team then reaches out to anyone who may have potentially been exposed to the infected person to alert them to the potential exposure and get them scheduled for required testing. If these people test positive, they'll of course be required to isolate. And if someone tests negative after being contact traced, they will still be required to be tested three times a week. And finally, anyone who is not vaccinated, who is exposed to someone infected, will be required to be tested and to quarantine. In late July, we reinstated mandatory masking in all the indoor spaces, including buses and common areas. And while masking is not required in outdoor spaces at this point, in particularly crowded outdoor settings in close proximity to others, people should be aware that masking really can provide an extra measure of protection. Now, of course, children younger than 12 still are not eligible to receive the vaccine, and parents want to make sure they're doing everything possible to protect their children. So Mary, what would you suggest that faculty members or students with young children or other medically vulnerable household members do in order to do to further reduce the risk and anxiety related to returning to in-person classes? Well, certainly important for all, all of us that can get vaccinated to be vaccinated and then being vigilant about indoor masking and enforcing the mask requirement for students ex is extremely important. Instructors may also want to take a little extra time at the beginning of the semester emphasizing to students the importance of personal responsibility related to masking. As I mentioned, the vaccination protects ourselves, but things like masking helps us protect other individuals. And that students, and for that matter, faculty, should report any COVID symptoms immediately, stay home, not come to class if they're having symptoms unless they've been tested and cleared by student health. Reinforcing these messages with our students is so important to helping them understand that we have a responsibility as a community to keep each other safe. And frankly, I think we've done that extraordinarily well for the last year or so to help protect those among us who are more vulnerable, including unvaccinated children of our faculty, staff and students and in immunocompromised individuals and vaccinated people at higher risk for complications. In fact, in many ways, that is what is most important about masking protecting those around us. Although faculty members who are vaccinated aren't required to participate in regular surveillance testing, they can opt in for testing. And if being tested on a regular basis would provide some additional reassurance, that's something I'd suggest considering as well. There are multiple sites around campus and the testing is quick and easy. I should add that whenever we have a positive test, the viral RNA is sequenced. So we will have early warning if we see any unexpected variants. And th this information helps inform our strategy. Double masking is another approach people can consider for an extra bit of reassurance. And for anyone who is immunocompromised, comp vaccine boosters are coming online. They should discuss that with their physician. We'll keep everyone informed of the, the availability of a booster through Duke's vaccination program. In fact, the surveillance testing will continue to inform our response going forward. And with these measures in place, it's unlikely that faculty will bring COVID home from the classroom. Thanks, Mary. Thanks for sharing your expertise. And you know, before we go, I just want to make a few important points to my faculty colleagues as we get ready to embark on the semester. First, we need to emphasize to students the importance of reaching out and staying in communication with their faculty members, especially in cases where they may need to miss in-person classes due to COVID symptoms or COVID diagnosis. Second, students who are diagnosed with COVID will be using the regular accommodations processes that were in place before the pandemic. While we want you to work with a student who has to miss class in the same way you always would, 
we do not expect or want you to develop hybrid courses or take your class online to accommodate a student who's in isolation. I've heard some concerns that students won't want to miss class and will succumb to class even if they're ill. And you know, we'll be sure to send the message that that is a disciplinary issue if students knowingly come to class while ill. I have to say though, that I was really heartened to learn just how appreciative our students were of our faculty last year. We have recent data from Trinity College showing that over the last year, students consistently rated their faculty and academic mentors as a primary source of wellness support following only friends and family. And that will be even more the case in person. Finally, I've asked what conditions was pro would prompt us to change course. And as I mentioned, we're keeping a close eye on where transmissions occur when we have positive cases and also on the viral variants. And we're measuring and tracking a number of factors around the clock, including number of cases, mode of transmission, severity of illness, and our isolation capacity. And we are in close contact with our peer schools to learn from what they're experiencing, including schools that have had students on campus through the Delta surge this summer. We're also mindful what's happening in the K-12 schools since parents could wind up with young children at home again. We don't have a bright line in the sand. Rather, we are in daily contact with our infectious disease experts, environmental health experts, local officials, and infection modelers to assess the risk of infection on campus. And we meet with those teams multiple times a week to review developments and consider whether we need to make adjustments. Our goal is to deliver in-person a world-class educational experience for our students and to ensure the continued high-level operation of our research enterprise. But we need to do that while keeping our community safe. So Mary, I wanna thank you again for joining me in this conversation. And we're preparing a much more extensive FAQ that will be posted on our website in the next few days. These will address many more questions than we could cover here. But please feel free to email any additional questions to response at duke.edu. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to seeing many of you over the course of the semester. So thanks again, Mary.